In my opinion, this video is, in all seriousness, the most important video which I have created for this channel thus far. This video isn't going to be presenting or evaluating any particular theories developed by myself or other thinkers. Rather, in this video, I'm going to be attempting to take an uncomfortably honest look at the nature of modern science at the epistemological playing field of modern culture and the role which academic institutions have come to play in the continuous game of beliefs, doubt, certainty, and legitimacy. There are certainly going to be many people who do not like what I have to say in this video. It's simply not realistic to expect a two hour long video to convince most people that their most basic convictions about the world might be deeply distorted. Those convictions serve a very real and significant psychological purpose in establishing a person's sense of groundedness and certainty about the world that they are a part of. And letting go of those convictions is far from easy or trivial for very good reasons. For many people, this video will probably feel like I am attempting to shatter the core beliefs which ground one's sense of religious faith. Ultimately, that is exactly what I am attempting to do here, and I do not take that task lightly. This is a conversation which I believe desperately needs to happen, especially within the context of the historical events which have happened over the past few years. Like it or not, this is a conversation which is already ongoing, and the more it is brought out into the light of public awareness, the better. But before we get started, let's take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. With the help of Atlas VPN, you can rest assured that your internet browsing is safe and secure, regardless as to what rabbit holes you might find yourself falling down. With Atlas VPN's limited time Black Friday special price cut, you can protect your internet presence on all of your devices for just $1.70 per month and get an additional six months free of charge covered by a 30-day money-back guarantee. By clicking my link in the video description, you will be able to block ads and malware, protect your personal information and browsing data, and access content that might not be available in your home country by changing your location. Having your identity or password stolen can be catastrophic, but with Atlas VPN, you can very easily ensure your protection. Atlas VPN offers an extremely convenient and easy to understand user interface with which you can encrypt your data and change your location at the push of a button. Follow the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen and protect yourself with the most effective and most affordable VPN service on the market for just $1.70 per month with an additional six months for free. Thank you so much to Atlas VPN for sponsoring and now back to the video. Robert Maxwell was born in 1923 to an impoverished family of Orthodox Jews in a region of Czechoslovakia, which is now part of modern-day Ukraine. Following the outbreak of the Second World War, Robert Maxwell would flee to France and would come to join the Czechoslovakian army in exile. In 1944, most of Maxwell's family would be murdered in the Auschwitz concentration camp following the occupation of Hungary by Nazi Germany. Following the end of World War II, Robert Maxwell, now a recognized war hero, would go on to become an immensely successful businessman and politician within Great Britain, and his interests would largely focus upon publishing. In 1948, Maxwell would co-found the Pergamon Press Publishing House, a company which specialized in the publication of academic, medical, and scientific research papers, books, and journals. It is through Robert Maxwell's business career in publishing that the world of academic journalism as we now know it would come into being. Maxwell offered universities and libraries access to international research and, as such, a demand developed for such publications as scientific and medical institutions wanted to maintain access to such international research as a means of staying up to date with the various rapidly evolving branches of modern science. Throughout his career, Robert Maxwell would continue to expand his publishing empire, eventually coming to subsume the British Printing Corporation, Mirror Group Newspapers, and Macmillan Publishers, along with many others. 
This was a very lucrative business model, as Maxwell's clients were predominantly state-funded institutions, such as libraries and universities. Ultimately, it was taxpayers who fronted the bill for such exclusive access to these academic publications, even though the general public itself was not granted public access to them. The general public was literally denied access to the results of the research, which their own tax dollars paid for. And through this monopolization of access, Robert Maxwell and his family were able to become grotesquely affluent. Maxwell was well known to live an immensely flamboyant lifestyle, sailing the world in his luxury mega yacht named the Lady Ghislaine, named after his youngest daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell. Over the course of subsequent decades, Robert would expand his interests into the realm of international politics, developing relations with Eastern European totalitarian regimes and becoming involved with Israeli state intelligence services. Ultimately, the fate of Robert Maxwell would not be a pleasant one. Maxwell was faced with the prospects of defaulting on massive debts and had been forced to sell some of his businesses in order to contend with those debts. In 1991, Maxwell would skip a scheduled meeting with the Bank of England to cruise in his yacht among the Canary Islands, and during this time he would be reported missing, later to be found dead floating in the Atlantic Ocean. Maxwell's exact cause of death has remained a subject of speculation, with some suggesting that he was assassinated by the Israeli government or by one of his business affiliates. Following his death, investigations would come to reveal an immense and tangled web of fraud, financial malpractice, and theft which would result in the utter collapse of his business empire. What is significant for our current purposes is that Robert Maxwell was the man who was, in many ways, responsible for how academic science came to be shaped after the end of the Second World War. Even after his death, the practices which he instantiated would continue to shape the way that modern science was conducted, financed, and incentivized even unto the present day. Academic publishing is in many ways the lifeblood of modern science. Academic institutions require their researchers to publish research, and academic journals are able to actually charge researchers for publishing their papers. This system works because under most circumstances, the researchers themselves aren't required to actually dip into their own pockets to make such payments to journals. Rather, research grants typically include provisions for such publishing fees, meaning that it is you and I who actually pay for the racketeering practices which were instantiated by Robert Maxwell and those who followed in his footsteps. Due to the system of financial incentives and professional obligations, publishing organizations and researchers are both equally motivated to publish research even if the research is poorly conducted or even fraudulent. Scientists need to publish research in order to keep their jobs, and publishing companies make money regardless as to whether or not that research is actually useful or whether the conclusions of such research can actually stand against serious criticism. Now, of course, we might all like to think that there are reliable fail-safes in place which could prevent such a system from devolving into a maelstrom of fraud and abuse. Surely, the scientific method and the practices of peer review have served to ensure that scientific findings are actually reliable, right? Well, if you're thinking that, I have some bad news. In fact, I have a lot of bad news. At this point, we have all probably heard the murmurs of what has come to be dubbed the replication crisis within academic research. The notion of replicability is generally considered to be of central significance within the apologetics of academic science. Idealistically speaking, replication is believed to serve as a means of ensuring that the findings produced by scientific research do actually point towards the regularities of nature which science strives to reveal. If a finding cannot be replicated, then that of course casts doubt on whether the original research actually uncovered such a regularity. Some research findings could have manifested due to factors which were not adequately controlled for. 
If, for example, I am a sociological researcher who is conducting research which investigates a possible correlation between political beliefs and life expectancy, I could very easily produce research which seems to show such a correlation simply because of inadequate controls. If the majority of the people surveyed are people who live in a specific geographical location, or who predominantly belong to a specific economic class or ethnicity, then it could be that my research findings come up to misleadingly depict a correlation between political beliefs and life expectancy, when in reality the patterns detected by my research are due to factors which I have simply failed to take into consideration. Reality is, of course, extremely complicated, and due to the fundamentally relational nature of reality, it is never actually possible to completely isolate the factors which we wish to study scientifically, which means that there is always going to be a risk of such false positives, no matter how rigorous we try to be. These practices of isolating variables and the metaphysical assumptions which are implied within such practices are something we will be scrutinizing in more detail later on, once we begin to look more closely at the epistemological and ontological assumptions which condition scientific practices. But for now, we simply need to be aware of the fact that even the most thorough and stringent research can and does fall victim to such false positives, and therefore, even if we were able to entirely eradicate fraud and malpractice, it would nonetheless inevitably be the case that many research findings would still fail to replicate. In principle, replication gives us at least some reassurance that scientific findings are more than mere fraud, malpractice, or false positives, assuming of course that replication studies themselves don't also fail to account for certain variables. A great deal of public and professional confidence in scientific research hinges upon the assumption that the research findings which are reported as factual are findings which have been successfully replicated. Beginning with a series of controversies which emerged during the 2010s, however, this confidence would come to be damaged in an utterly catastrophic manner. The replication crisis can be traced back to research published in 2011 by the Cornell University social psychologist Daryl Bim, within which Bim alleged to have produced experimental evidence suggestive of extrasensory perception. Unsurprisingly, Bim was viciously criticized for this research, and in an effort to discredit his findings, Bim's critics highlighted what they regarded as serious methodological flaws in his research. Essentially, these criticisms amounted to the claim that the statistical methods used by Bim in analyzing his data were inadequate. Yet, as Bim pointed out in his response to his critics, the supposed flaw in his research was in fact common practice within psychological, medical, and sociological research in general. If Bim's parapsychological findings were to be thrown out on those methodological grounds, then an enormous amount of psychological, medical, and sociological research would need to be thrown out as well for the exact same reasons. Bim's critics, of course, weren't actually willing to accept that conclusion, and instead suggested that the real reason his study couldn't be taken seriously was because there was, quote, no known mechanism by which such extrasensory perception could occur, which is essentially the same as confidently declaring that lightning can't be real because one lacks a theory of electromagnetism. Regardless as to whether or not Bim's specific findings were legitimate or not, the floodgates had been irreversibly opened. Further controversies continued to mount following a series of attempts to replicate a 1996 study within behavioral psychology research, which purported to demonstrate a kind of epidemiological osmosis of stereotyped behavior patterns through exposure to those stereotyped behaviors. Essentially, the study seemed to demonstrate how human beings come to unknowingly mimic certain behavior patterns when we are unconsciously primed to do so. 
The study was not an obscure footnote. The study had been cited thousands of times, and it was regularly used in university education programs. Yet, replication studies published in 2012 failed to actually replicate the findings, and subsequent studies which attempted to replicate the same phenomenon using different methods also failed. Concerns about methodology and replicability continued to stir up controversy in subsequent years. Critics began to highlight the alarmingly low replication rates among biomedical findings which were actually being implemented within pharmaceutical and medical practices. Attempts to replicate landmark biomedical research was shown to fail in over 80% of cases. This is what scientists often refer to as a really big f***ing deal as such biomedical research is used in the development and implementation of pharmaceutical drugs and other such medical practices. Now, to be 100,000% clear, I am not a medical doctor. Do not take medical advice from me, but what these findings seem to show is that many, if not most, people are taking drugs that are alleged to treat certain medical problems on the basis of research findings which cannot be adequately corroborated. These failures have been a massive blow to confidence in scientific research for obvious reasons. Meta-studies have concluded that as many as two-thirds of findings within psychological, sociological, and medical research cannot be successfully replicated. I should also emphasize that these failures of replication are not confined to obscure or marginal studies which are of little consequence. Researchers who have studied the replication crisis itself have shown that findings which have failed to replicate are often findings which are cited more often than others. The phrase, trust the science, is sometimes repeated like a kind of shibboleth or mantra. You can find this sentiment expressed by public officials, medical professionals, and pharmaceutical companies. You can find it on t-shirts and bumper stickers. Professional journalists use terms like anti-science or science denial as labels to slap on whatever group needs to be designated as the villain within whatever political narrative is being evangelized this week. In spite of how oft-repeated and ubiquitous this attitude towards science is, the reality seems to be that we cannot and should not trust the science. We should regard scientific claims in the same way that we regard any other claims. Regarding any given findings with a degree of healthy skepticism until we have adequate reason to believe that the findings are actually valid. After all, that is what science itself is supposed to be, is it not? The very ideal of science is an attitude of unbiased inquiry, which does not pay reverence to established dogmas or doctrines. The great promise of science is that of knowledge which one is able to uncover through one's direct engagement with nature, rather than knowledge which is bestowed from on high by authority figures and institutions. The very concept of scientific practice would seem to be diametrically opposed to the notion of pious adherence to a corpus of established beliefs which are officially endorsed and authorized by an institutional bureaucracy. The latter would seem to be a twisted parody of science rather than actual science, and yet this twisted parody seems to be precisely what modern science has come to be. Within this notion of trusting science, we can begin to see that the very idea of science has come to split into two primary currents. On the one hand, there is the notion of science as a continual practice of investigation, actually engaging with the natural world and thereby coming to reveal the inner workings of nature. On the other hand, we have the notion of the science. Science understood as a body of facts which we are authorized to believe, or even obligated to believe, by a priesthood of professional academics whose sociological function is to tell us what is and is not a defensible belief. 
ultimately the science is, in essence, a fundamentally doctrinal form of spirituality. It is by no means simply a corpus of facts and figures and corroborated hypotheses, and in reality there is no way it ever could have been only that. Beneath the specific empirical claims made by actual researchers, or the facts and theories which are formally sanctioned by textbooks, we find within the core of the science a very specific complex of metaphysical assumptions about what the world must be like and what can or cannot qualify as true or real. It is furthermore a system of belief which conditions the way we think about what sorts of opinions can be considered respectable, and thus the structure of the science comes to condition the relationships between belief and social capital. Those who are well-informed and well-educated believe certain things, and therefore such beliefs come to serve a sociological function as a signifier of social respectability. Conversely, other beliefs come to be affiliated with the unsophisticated, ignorant masses. This streak goes both ways, however. Once certain beliefs or hypotheses come to be heavily affiliated with these structures of social capital, then those structures of social capital come to actually condition what scientists expect to find when they actually study nature itself. Many scientists aren't exactly all that eager to publish findings which might call into question, for example, the adequacy of Darwinian natural selection in actually explaining the nature of life, even though there are many reasons to believe that natural selection does not give us a complete understanding of how life evolves, whence life originated, or how speciation actually occurs. Yet, to question the Darwinian paradigm would be to risk affiliating oneself with creationists or other structures of belief which have been deemed anti-science. This goes far beyond professional academics simply scoffing at the allegedly misguided beliefs of the plebeians. In 2015, the Royal Society of London hosted a conference titled New Trends in Evolution. The purpose of this conference was specifically to look at ideas within evolutionary biology which could go beyond the neo-Darwinian paradigm, and some of those attending evidently saw these ideas as having rather radical potential to transform our understanding of life. One of the conference organizers stated that the aim of the conference was to move towards, quote, new interpretations, new questions, and even a whole new causal structure for biology. Now, for most of us, it probably wouldn't seem that there is anything amiss in this endeavor. The New Trends in Evolution conference probably seems like a rather open and shut case of actual scientists convening in order to do some actual science, and I would certainly agree with that assessment. However, many members of the Royal Society seem to disagree. Following the announcement of the conference, 23 Royal Society members signed a letter of protest, demanding that the conference be cancelled. One of the signatories stated, quote, the fact that the society would hold a meeting that gave the public the idea that this stuff is mainstream is disgraceful." End quote. This is, of course, a very strange statement, since when did scientists have an obligation to only promote or even publicly discuss ideas that were considered mainstream? The statement seems to be almost comically in opposition to the stated goals and methods of scientific research, and yet 23 members of the most prestigious scientific organization in the world seem to have shared that very sentiment. If we try to understand this controversy in terms of scientists doing science, then it makes no sense whatsoever. But if we understand the controversy in terms of doctrine, ideology, and notions of sacred knowledge, then the motivations at work here begin to become much clearer. 
The letter of protest against the New Trends in Evolution conference was not about science. It was about the science. The conception of science as a body of sacred doctrines. Whether one affirms, questions, or denies such sacred knowledge is much more a matter of moral commitment to a particular ideological structure than it is a matter of evidence or rational arguments. Oftentimes the rhetoric and apologetics of the science tends to take the form of an implied distinction between real science and pseudoscience. We are often assured by scientific media outlets and science popularizers that there is a clear and definitive difference between science and pseudoscience. Science can be true or false, but pseudoscience is said to be somehow worse than false. Pseudoscience is said to violate the rules of science, and therefore it is not even worthy of consideration alongside the real, respectable science which is said to follow the ritualistic procedures of science in the correct, orthodox manner. So that all sounds well and good, but then what exactly is the distinction between real science and pseudoscience? How can we tell whether we are looking at one or the other? Surely there must be some rather clear indications which we can look to so as to determine whether a given hypothesis is actually science or not, given that science writers and popularizers have taken to using the term pseudoscience as their most reliable blunt instrument for beating down those who disagree with them. In pursuing this question, we bring ourselves to what has been dubbed the demarcation problem within the philosophy of science. The demarcation problem is the problem of how we are to distinguish or demarcate between what does or does not actually qualify as science. Now, from a rather common sense perspective, this probably doesn't seem like it should be a very difficult problem to solve. Science is a method for actually investigating nature. In doing science, we carefully observe nature, either within the natural world itself or within experimental settings, and then develop ideas about how nature actually operates. We then take those ideas and see what we can do with them. Do they actually allow us to do things that we couldn't do before? Do those ideas allow us to make sense of things that previously seemed mysterious? Do the ideas allow us to see things which previously went unnoticed? If yes, then we continue to use those ideas, at least until we find ourselves at an impasse at which our ideas are no longer adequate and therefore are in need of reevaluation. If not, we simply go back to nature and back to the drawing board and try again. This seems like a fairly clear-cut way of understanding science as something which is distinct from fields such as mathematics, formal logic, theology, or metaphysics. So congratulations everyone, we just solved the demarcation problem within the philosophy of science. And yet, alas, this very straightforward, traditional, and common sense understanding of science doesn't really give science apologists the weapons which they need to bludgeon their enemies into submission. As such, the priests of the science have opted for attempting to conceptualize science in a manner that allows for a distinction between real science and so-called pseudoscience, which can be simply dismissed as a matter of principle without any need for conceptual evaluation or consideration of evidence. Many of you have at least some familiarity with the notion of falsification in regards to debates about the validity of this or that theory or hypothesis. The notion of falsification is often casually referenced in debates about such validity or the lack thereof, but this idea is very rarely examined in detail by science apologists. More often than not, the idea is simply gestured towards as a way of casually dismissing ideas that aren't supposed to have a seat at the table. 
it is said that real science must be falsifiable and that pseudoscientific claims are those which appear to be scientific but which are in fact unfalsifiable. This notion of falsifiability as the central factor in distinguishing science from non-science can be traced back to the Austrian philosopher of science, Karl Popper. Within his 1934 text, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, Popper developed an epistemological framework which he referred to as critical rationalism, within which the notion of falsifiability served the central role of distinguishing between scientific and unscientific claims. In many ways, the system which Popper develops in the logic of scientific discovery can be understood as a response to the verificationist or logical positivist school of thought which had been prominent within philosophy of science in previous decades. The verificationists had argued that the criteria which separated science from non-science was, of course, verification. Scientific claims were said to be those which could be verified through observation of the natural world. Any claims which made no predictions about the natural world were therefore unverifiable as a matter of principle. If, for example, I were to claim that the entire universe, including every single atom and even space itself, doubled in size yesterday, then that claim would be unverifiable. The universe would look exactly the same regardless as to whether my claim was true or not. I can't check and see if the atoms have actually doubled in size because my only means of doing that would be to compare the size of the atoms to other things. If literally everything has doubled in size, then that means I have no way to check whether the size of the atoms have changed or not. That claim, therefore, would seem to be neither true nor false, but rather simply meaningless. The verificationists thus concluded that verifiability and meaningfulness were actually synonymous. Any claim that was meaningful was by definition verifiable, and by extension it could be said that only verifiable claims could qualify as scientific theory. Karl Popper, however, saw that there were some very serious problems with this framework. First of all, if we are to claim that only verifiable claims are meaningful, then that very claim itself is by definition meaningless. We cannot assign a truth value to the statement, quote, only verifiable claims are meaningful, end quote, because that very statement is not a claim about the natural world, and therefore not a claim which can be verified through observation. In other words, the claim made by the verificationist school of thought seems to be self-defeating. As such, Popper operated under no such pretensions of demarcating between meaningful and meaningless uses of language. He was perfectly willing to admit that many metaphysical claims were perfectly meaningful and even necessary, even if such claims were not necessarily scientific per se. Yet for Popper, there was an even deeper issue at hand, namely that empirical observations could never actually verify scientific theories in a conclusive manner. If I tell you that it is raining outside, then you can check and see, but that is a particular claim, not a generalizable scientific theory. If, on the other hand, I claim that it always rains when the atmospheric humidity reaches a certain threshold, then that is a scientific hypothesis. But due to its general nature, that raises a very serious issue about how to determine whether or not the claim is actually true. Of course, we can check and see whether it actually rains when the humidity reaches that threshold, but no matter how many positive correlations we observe, the possibility of falsification will always remain. 
I might observe a confirmation of my conjectured correlation thousands of times, but no matter how many times I observe it raining when the humidity increases, that will never be enough to definitively prove that my hypothesis is correct. If my claim is that such a correlation holds 100% of the time, then all it takes is one incorrect prediction to falsify the entire hypothesis, and we can never be absolutely certain that such a falsifying event won't occur. Because this is a general claim about nature, believing that the claim is actually true requires inductive reasoning. In other words, generalizing from previous observations in order to make claims about observations which have yet to occur. Popper saw this as a massive problem as it potentially implied that no such generalizations could actually be warranted epistemologically. In other words, it seemed to imply that no scientific claims could actually be justified rationally. Popper's solution to this problem was to create a scientific epistemology which was grounded in a conception of falsification rather than verification. A million positive confirmations cannot definitively prove an absolute generalization about the regularities of nature, but it takes only one falsification to render a generalization invalid. Building upon this insight, Popper came to conceptualize scientific practice as being essentially isomorphic to the process of Darwinian natural selection. Scientists would create theories and then testing would be an attempt to falsify rather than verify the conjectures made by such theories. Theories which made false predictions would be eliminated and those that remained would live to see another day a kind of epistemological survival of the fittest, as it were. As scientists repeated this procedure, theories would come to predict the world more accurately as less fit theories came to be abandoned and surviving theories came to avoid the failings of their discredited predecessors. Popper's framework for understanding the nature of science proved to be immensely influential, and subsequently the notion of falsification would enter common parlance within scientific debates and apologetics. But despite the apparent success of Popper's critical rationalism, numerous problems with this framework would soon become apparent. Popper's framework implied that scientific theories were abandoned once they became falsified by conflicting evidence to make way for new theories which might have a better chance at withstanding the crucible of falsification. Yet as researchers came to actually look at the actual history of science, what they came to find was something much different than what Popper's critical rationalism implied. In 1962, the historian and philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn would publish The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which Kuhn developed a model of scientific evolution through examining the history of science itself, rather than looking at the issue through an entirely abstract and theoretical lens as Popper had done. Contrary to Popper's claims about the nature of scientific epistemology, Kuhn found that, in reality, failed predictions usually do not result in the abandonment of scientific theories. Much more often, conflicting evidence is simply ignored or dismissed, or a theory is modified in some way, so as to account for the apparently conflicting observations. As Kuhn studied the history of science, what he found was that science seems to proceed through the gradual germination, maturation, and senescence of conceptual and explanatory frameworks which he referred to as paradigms. Each paradigm begins with a phase which Kuhn refers to as pre-science in which the earliest, adventurous explorations lead to the development of the basic conceptual building blocks, 
the most basic metaphors which will give shape to the emerging scientific paradigm. The early explorations of pre-science then give rise to what Kuhn dubbed normal science, within which the basic explanatory and conceptual structures of the developing paradigm begin to concretize as a morphologically mature program of research with well-defined epistemological horizons which are delineated by the core metaphors which have now become the beating heart of the paradigm. It is within this phase of normal science that falsification tends to become essentially irrelevant. The core metaphors and thus the core theoretical frameworks which are erected around those core metaphors have come to be fully entrenched and as such Conflicting evidence tends to be simply ignored, hand-waved away, or accommodated by minor ad hoc adjustments to the original theoretical frameworks. Simply put, real scientific theories simply are not falsifiable in the manner that Popper had suggested, because there are always going to be convenient ways to preserve a theory even in light of conflicting evidence, whether that be through adjustments made to a theory directly, adjustments made to other related theories which allow for reinterpretation of evidence, or simply through regarding contradictory evidence as anomalous noise. Kuhn's overall point was not that these facts constitute scientific malpractice, but rather that this is simply how real science actually works, for better or for worse. The quasi-Darwinian algorithm of selection through falsification, which Popper believed to be the core of scientific epistemology, is simply not how real science develops and progresses. Rather than simply falling to pieces due to contradictory evidence, scientific paradigms instead tend to die very slow and arduous deaths. As more and more contradictory evidence comes to mount, the adjustments needed to accommodate such observations come to warp and deform the core metaphors which serve as the heart of the paradigm. The paradigm thus comes to enter what Kuhn refers to as a crisis phase, in which the core metaphors of the paradigm become unable to continue supporting the theoretical complex which has been built upon them. A paradigm shift then comes to occur as the previous core metaphors come to be supplanted by new metaphors, new ways of thinking, new conceptual schemes, and new assumptions about the nature of nature. If we take a moment to zoom out a bit, what we can begin to see is that the pattern which Kuhn identifies in the evolution of science is a pattern which we have seen before. The life cycles of scientific paradigms are characterized by phases which perfectly mirror the phases of biological life cycles which Johann von Goethe identified, and moreover, scientific paradigms seem to grow out of core metaphors in the exact same way that Goethe saw biological life forms as growing out of an archetypal or phenomenon. If we look at Oswald Spengler's theoretical history, we see this exact same pattern within the life cycles of civilizations, and in fact Spengler was directly influenced by Goethe in this regard. Civilizations are constituted by culture forms, or form languages, which grow outward as elaborations upon certain core archetypal myths, motifs, and symbols which give shape to the civilization as a whole. Science, in other words, does not simply consist in isolated propositions which we can simply check off as true or false one by one. Rather, science consists of paradigms which are comprised of living, breathing systems of metaphors, practices, cultural expectations, institutions, and structures of authority and expertise. 
We should recall that one of the driving factors in the development of Popper's critical rationalism was the desire to eliminate induction from scientific epistemology, as Popper saw inductive inference as epistemologically invalid. No matter how many times we have seen the sun rise in the morning, we cannot prove that it will continue to rise each morning in the future, so it seems. Even though we might observe that, for example, the speed of light has remained constant each time we have measured it, that does not give us warrant for believing that the speed of light won't simply change tomorrow afternoon. Popper's concept of falsification was an attempt to rid induction from scientific epistemology. Within Popper's critical rationalist framework, theories can never be proven, but only disproven. We end up with an epistemology in which no theory can actually be said to be true, but only that it is less false than those which have been discredited. But if this is actually the case, then why should we have any confidence that the theories which have survived will actually continue to work? If we really have no reason to believe that the alleged laws of physics will actually continue to hold tomorrow, how can we actually justify hedging our bets on the assumption that they will continue to hold? Of course, this is something which people rarely concern themselves with in real life, and which scientists themselves rarely worry about. We don't stay awake at night wondering if the sun will actually rise tomorrow, but this is specifically because both ordinary people and scientists are never simply operating on a procedural system of logical inference. We operate under assumptions about what the world is actually like. We assume that nature itself is constituted by a harmonious order, and moreover, our beliefs and thoughts about the world are conditioned by a cohesive system of metaphors, through which we conceptualize what that harmonious order might be like. Seen within this context, we can therefore see that Popper's attempt to rid scientific methodology of induction was actually an attempt to cleanly divide science from metaphysics. His epistemological system was in essence intended to quarantine off science from non-science, and specifically from metaphysics. Once we actually look at how science works, however, we can see that this endeavor was doomed from the start. Science and metaphysics cannot be split apart from one another, because science and metaphysics are in fact inextricably codependent upon one another. One simply cannot do science without operating within the horizons of a given paradigm and that entails operating within the bounds of metaphysical presumptions about the nature of the world in general. And yet with Popper's critical rationalism, and with the rhetoric of many of the science apologists which succeeded him, what we see is a concerted effort towards intentionally obfuscating this reality by construing science as though it were merely a kind of algorithmic procedure which could operate independently of metaphysical presumptions about the nature of reality. This obfuscation of the metaphysical underpinnings of science has served a very significant ideological purpose, in that it has allowed for the deployment of the illusion that scientific knowledge is a corpus of facts which have been procedurally verified beyond any reasonable doubt. If we are led to believe that there are no metaphysical or ideological presuppositions which underpin science, then we are much less likely to raise awkward questions about whether or not those presuppositions themselves might be distorting our conception of the world. This has thus allowed the apologists of the science to depict science as though it were a kind of elite priesthood of individuals who are the appointed curators of a body of sacred knowledge. 
the science is depicted as being that which is authorized and approved by that elite priesthood alone, meaning that those outside of the academic priesthood who dare to criticize the science can be seen as quacks or simpletons who have overstepped the bounds which have been sanctified by the elite. Philosophers and laymen simply must accept what science hands down to them, and those who question such ordained knowledge, or God forbid, attempt to produce alternative theories, are denounced as perpetuators of the ever-nefarious pseudoscience. But as we have seen, the conceptual foundations of that distinction between science and pseudoscience are themselves simply a misrepresentation of what actual science actually is, and how science actually operates and evolves over time. If pseudoscience is defined as that which is unfalsifiable, then we might as well regard all science as pseudoscience. Because, as Kuhn and others have demonstrated, any accepted paradigm of science is going to be unfalsifiable in the sense that scientists will simply disregard conflicting evidence or make slight adjustments to their hypotheses so as to preserve that paradigm. Any claim about the world will be, strictly speaking, falsifiable insofar as any claim about the world will be claims which the world may or may not accord with. Yet any claim about the world can be modified so as to be preserved when confronted with conflicting observations. Ultimately, what this all means, then, is that Popper's formulation of scientific method doesn't really give us a way to conceptually distinguish between science and pseudoscience. Nor does it allow science to proceed without the need for metaphysical assumptions about the fundamental nature of reality. To an extent, we can regard falsifiability as a means of distinguishing science from non-empirical fields such as pure mathematics or formal logic, but that distinction does not do the work which science apologists want it to do. Science apologists and popularizers want falsification to be a criterion for distinguishing the science which is sanctioned by the academic clergy from the science which can be dismissed as heretical, and ultimately Popper's critical rationalism cannot facilitate such a distinction. To be clear, I'm not necessarily saying that the notion of pseudoscience is itself necessarily nonsensical, but what I am saying is that if we are going to use that term at all, then we need to use it in a way that actually makes sense. For example, let's say that I am advertising a product which is allegedly meant to serve as a cure for high blood pressure. Then let's say I dress up my advertisement of that product in a bunch of vaguely scientific sounding terminology in order to convince people to buy the product, even though I don't have any real reason to believe that it actually works. That example is something that I think we could rightly refer to as pseudoscience, because it is an attempt to appropriate the perceived aura of expertise that we often associate with science as a means of manipulation. But of course, this is not how the term pseudoscience tends to be actually used within academic apologetics. The term tends to be most often used instead as a kind of blunt instrument with which to casually dispose of any criticisms of accepted academic doctrine or theories which are at odds with such doctrinal beliefs. Many of the theories which we have looked at on this channel in previous videos, such as electric universe theory, morphic resonance theory, inheritance of acquired characteristics, and even integrated information theory, have been denounced as pseudoscience in such a way as to imply that these theories somehow violate the supposed rules of science. Now, of course, any of those aforementioned theories could be either partially or even completely incorrect. I'm not going to try to convince anyone of the veracity of any of those theories in this video, 
because that's not my point. My point is that the allegation of pseudoscience carries with it the implication that these theories somehow violate the established epistemological standards of science, and yet, as we have already begun to see, such rules don't really even exist, and when science apologists attempt to formulate a depiction of what those alleged rules should be, what we tend to find is that actual scientists don't actually follow those alleged rules anyway. The difference between sanctified science and heretical science is much more often a matter of whether or not a given theory accords with the core paradigm of established, institutionalized knowledge. In other words, whether the theory can be rationalized in terms of the core metaphors which condition the morphology of the prevailing paradigm. Recall the criticisms we saw earlier of Daryl Bem's purported evidence for extrasensory perception. Critics initially claimed that Bem's research was methodologically flawed, that it broke the supposed rules of science in some way, only for it to be revealed that those alleged missteps were in fact common practice within mainstream science. Unwilling to accept the implication that the vast majority of psychological research was methodologically invalid, his critics instead retreated to the position that his findings could not be true because there was, quote, no known mechanism for such a phenomenon. What this tells us is that these critics weren't really motivated by a methodological suspicion anyway. Were that the case, then undoubtedly they would have uncovered such supposed methodological flaws much earlier within mainstream research. That didn't happen because these critics simply were not looking for methodological flaws within mainstream research. They had no reason to. The reason which actually motivated them to apply such scrutiny to BIM's research in particular is revealed within the phrase, no known mechanism. Within that phrase, we can see a gesture towards what is in fact the core metaphor of the prevailing scientific paradigm, the metaphor of the machine. This mechanistic metaphor came to germinate within the earliest phases of modern science, as the notion of the clockwork universe and clockmaker god came to inform the development of science and the philosophy of science in the 18th century. This mechanistic conception of nature was never truly unanimous among scientists, and we can see that figures such as Johann von Goethe and others mounted a fierce resistance to the machine metaphor even in the earliest periods of the paradigm's development. Yet, as the 18th century gave way to the 19th, this machine metaphor came to become the central and dominant metaphor within scientific thinking, as the development of machine science resulted, unsurprisingly, in the development of ever more sophisticated, complex, and precise machine technologies. Such machine technologies came to directly condition the manner in which science was practiced, and even condition the form of scientific theories themselves. The laws of thermodynamics, for example, came about specifically through efforts to develop and understand the behavior of steam engines. As such, these laws proved to be very useful in the development of such technologies, but beneath the surface, we can see that this metaphor was being extended to nature in general. Scientists came to generalize these laws to the cosmos as a whole, and essentially came to think of the entire universe as being like a vast, expanding container of cooling steam. The residue of this metaphor persists even today in discussions pertaining to the supposed heat death of the universe. Closed mechanical systems tend to wind down over time as energy is lost as heat. If you are a scientist who has fully bought into the machine metaphor, then it seems perfectly reasonable to then conclude that the entire universe is winding down into a state of absolutely entropic thermal equilibrium in the same way that machine systems do so when there is no energy input from an external source. 
the mechanistic paradigm of thought which facilitated the development of machine technologies came to be generalized such that the universe itself, including biological life forms and even human minds, came to be understood as fundamentally mechanistic in nature. This generalization carried with it numerous implications which would prove to be immensely significant for the continuing development of science during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Mechanical systems were understood to be fundamentally deterministic, for example, implying that mechanical events are fully dictated by previous events and the material substrates of such events. The way that a clock operates, for example, is determined by the material structure of its parts and previous events such as a person winding the clock up. The clock does not make decisions or have any sort of causal agency. It is simply an artificial device which behaves in full accordance with its physical structure. There is no need to posit the existence of anything like mind or subjectivity in making sense of the clock's behavior. Likewise, this mechanistic metaphor also implies reductionism. That the clock, for example, can be understood entirely as a function of the parts which make it up. In effect, the word clock really just refers to an aggregation of parts, and the behavior of the whole is thus entirely bottom-up in essence. The clock does not tell its parts what to do, but the constituent parts of the clock completely determine what the clock does. This mode of thought is very useful for developing machine technologies. In order for a machine to operate effectively, the machine needs to be reliable. It needs to behave in the same way each time as conditioned by factors which the machine operator has control over. If the machine is behaving as though it has a will of its own, that's usually a way of saying that the machine is not working properly. The development of machines, therefore, necessitates an emphasis upon identifying constants which can then be precisely quantified and manipulated so as to produce very precise outcomes in a very consistent manner. If you're new to my channel, first of all, hi, how you doing? Glad to have you here. Second of all, this talk of a machine metaphor might just sound completely obvious to you. Especially if the way that you think about the world has been heavily influenced by academia or popular science literature. What else could the world even be, one might ask, if not a great complex of mechanical, deterministic processes? As it just so happens, however, there are in fact a great many ways of conceptualizing the nature of the world which are not centered upon such a machine metaphor, some of which were developed long before the emergence of modern science. Many, however, were developed specifically due to the realization that the mechanistic metaphor proves to be inadequate when we attempt to expand the bounds of scientific inquiry beyond the world of dead matter and into the world of living, self-generating systems, cognitive processes, or the cosmos at large. I'm not going to go into extreme detail in this video elaborating on what those alternative frameworks look like because this is a topic which I have covered at length in other videos, but what is significant here for our present purposes is that the mechanistic paradigm of science was never simply an obvious given. It was always a very specific manner of thinking about the world which was directly related to the manner by which machine technologies and technological forms of social engineering came to radically transform Western cultures over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. The primacy of the technological paradigm had always been on rather shaky ground in many ways and had been seriously criticized by many prominent philosophers and scientists such as Johann von Goethe, Henri Bergson, Alfred North Whitehead, and many, many others. During the early decades of the 20th century, the legitimacy of this paradigm came to be called into question even further through the development of what we now know as quantum field theory. Quantum field theory was a system which seemed to break all of the rules which were implied by the mechanistic metaphor. Quantum entanglement implied an action at a distance which is not mediated by relations of spatial proximity. 
Quantum indeterminacy implies that the basic constituents of nature are not fully conditioned by previous events. Quantum non-locality implies that entities can exist in a distributed manner rather than existing in a particular discrete location. Due to this alleged weirdness of the quantum world, the mechanistic manner of understanding nature proved to be simply inapplicable. Atoms, molecules, and electromagnetic phenomena could no longer be understood as being composed of tiny machines. But in the wake of this inadequacy, academic science did not simply throw out the machine metaphor. The metaphor had simply become far too entrenched within academic culture, and moreover, Western countries were beginning to become even more drastically technologized, and science was beginning to fully assume its role as a kind of priesthood which would serve to legitimize these social transformations through perpetuating the meta-narrative of scientific, technological, and liberal democratic progress. Rather than taking the spookiness of the quantum world as a clue that the core metaphor of machine science was in need of being reworked, academic science ultimately opted instead for a kind of metaphysical quietism, in which quantum theory came to be regarded almost like a kind of sacred mystery. Only the most fully initiated of the academic clergy would dare speak upon the nature of quantum theory, and it would eventually become common practice for physicists themselves to profess the notion that the quantum world simply could not be understood. The quantum, so it has often been suggested, is simply too strange for human minds to grapple with. This attitude came to most fully solidify in the aftermath of World War II. Following the war, the center of gravity of the world of physics came to shift from Germany to the United States, where a kind of pragmatist-flavored quietism would come into vogue. The mantra, shut up and calculate, was initially lifted from David Merman's criticisms of certain interpretations of quantum field theory, but the shut up and calculate attitude would eventually come to take on a life of its own as Richard Feynman popularized the notion that quantum mechanics simply could not be understood, but that such understanding was secondary and optional. Feynman's attitude suggested that there was simply no point in reading anything into the quantum world. The quantum world would have to remain beyond our capacity for interpretation, but the equations of quantum theory simply worked, and that pragmatic efficacy was the most fundamental consideration. If the equations worked, then they could be used, and questions about what those equations meant, or even what they actually describe, are at best secondary considerations, and at worst, a fool's errand. If we look at these developments through the lens of Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, then we might assume that the inability of the mechanistic paradigm to actually account for the quantum world would have resulted in that paradigm coming to enter a crisis period. Isolated instances of conflicting evidence can be explained away or dismissed, as is often the case, but such hand-waving could never be enough to contend with an inability to make sense of an entire field of science. Especially when that field of science is located within the heart of physics itself, the fundamental ground of the mechanistic worldview. These developments should have initiated a crisis period, followed by the gradual development of a new scientific paradigm, but this isn't really what happened. Some prominent thinkers, most notably Henri Bergson and Alfred North Whitehead, did indeed attempt to formulate new metaphysical ideas which were intended to serve as the foundations of a new phase in the evolution of science. Nevertheless, what happened within institutional science was quite different. The very inexplicability of quantum theory itself allowed it to play a role within a new ideological framework which came to concretize within the late 20th century. 
academia came more and more to resemble a kind of elite priesthood, consisting of the guardians of sacred knowledge, and quantum theory's very mysteriousness allowed it to serve as a signifier of that developing aura of incomprehensible mystery and the notion that such arcane knowledge was reserved for only the high priests themselves. Moreover, quantum theory came to be the primary signifier of a new framework of epistemological justification. As we can see in the phrase, shut up and calculate, the notion that science should no longer be expected to actually explain the world had come to prominence within scientific apologetics. As long as this theory made predictions that could serve technological purposes, then the theory could be considered true, even if it could not be interpreted in a manner that allowed for any real explanatory power. Academic science had thus begun to essentially abandon the very aspirations that drove the development of science from its very origins. Within physics, the very heart of mechanistic science, the quest of understanding nature had come to be subordinated to the quest of technologically dominating nature. Quantum theory did not usher in a new scientific paradigm because it instead heralded the abandonment of the scientific enterprise itself by scientific institutions. But quantum theory was not the only crisis-worthy development which came into play within the early 20th century. Paralleling the emergence of quantum theory was the development of special relativity and general relativity by Albert Einstein. Einstein's theories were regarded as monumentally groundbreaking for numerous reasons. Relativity provided a causal mechanism for gravity, understanding gravity not as a force, but rather as a result of the deformation of space itself. Relativity also seemed to seamlessly synthesize time, space, and the nature of light into a cohesive framework which could be generalized in such a manner that astrophysicists could systematically study the structure and evolution of the cosmos at unimaginably vast scales. Despite the elegance and brilliance of Einstein's theories, however, there were some very serious problems. Relativity theory and quantum field theory are simply incongruent with one another for numerous reasons. Relativity theory collapses time into space, such that time can be seen as a kind of fourth spatial dimension. Due to the fact that simultaneity is relativized in relation to velocity within relativity theory, and the fact that there is no privileged frame of reference, this means that within the theoretical framework of relativity, there can be no absolute sense in which an event can be said to have preceded or succeeded any other event. Relativity thus presents us with a cosmos in which temporal sequence itself is ultimately a kind of phenomenological illusion, something which is only real with regards to a particular frame of reference. Thus, from a hypothetical God's eye perspective, time would be essentially meaningless, which is to say that time simply does not exist independently of a particular vantage point. Within quantum field theory, however, this is not the case. A quantum event has either occurred already or it has not, and if a quantum event has not yet occurred, then that event exists within an indeterminate superposition in which the exact properties of the event have not been decided. In other words, there is a very concrete sense of before and after within quantum field theory which is not present within relativity theory. Within the former framework, there is a very real distinction between what has and has not yet occurred, whereas in the latter, all events are, objectively speaking, occurring at the same time. Within quantum field theory, space and time are two completely distinct kinds of dimensionality. Time cannot be simply collapsed into space within a quantum framework in the way that this is done in relativity. In quantum field theory, there is space and there is time, but there is no space-time, and thus no space-time curvature which could serve as a mechanism for gravity. 
these contradictions between these two fundamental theories are very substantial and far too serious to be simply ignored. Except that is kind of exactly what happened, actually. Lacking any clear resolution to these contradictions, physicists mostly just ignored this problem and carried along business as usual. Quantum field theorists continued doing quantum field theory and would go on to begin the extremely expensive, one might even say extremely lucrative, search for the various subatomic entities predicted by quantum theory. Astrophysicists, on the other hand, largely ignored the lack of space-time curvature implied by quantum theory and proceeded to begin making immensely far-reaching inferences about the nature of the cosmos under the assumption that Einstein's relativity theory was actually correct. The vast majority of the things which astrophysicists believe they know about the history and structure of our universe, the vast majority of the conclusions which are triumphantly proclaimed on public television by figures like Carl Sagan, Michio Kaku, or Neil deGrasse Tyson, are such inferences which are built upon the assumption that our cosmos is driven primarily by gravity, and that gravity operates through space-time curvature. Throughout the subsequent history of the 20th century, following the development of general relativity, astrophysicists would come to make many extremely confident proclamations about the origins of our universe, the age of our universe, the expansion rate of the universe, the life cycles of stars and galaxies, the ultimate fate of our universe, and the existence of unobservable entities such as black holes. Every step of the way, all of these inferences were depicted as factual, and the general public was repeatedly assured that these inferences were made with extreme confidence on the basis of incontestably well-established theories by elite professionals using the most cutting-edge technology available to mankind. All the while, every single one of these inferences was made on the basis of a theory which was demonstrably incomplete at best, and at worst, simply false. Astrophysicists, however, were highly motivated to make such inferences, to present their universities, the general public, and government institutions with the assurance that their work was on the right track and that it was producing reliable results which could be accepted with extreme confidence. Thousands of professional academic careers came to be built upon a foundation which was known to be, at best, incomplete, and yet the professionalization and institutionalization of science over previous decades had created incentive structures which strongly discouraged skepticism towards the prevailing paradigm. There was a lot of money on the line, and resisting the mainstream meant risking the possibility of being ostracized by one's professional community, and therefore risking one's career and livelihood. The faith which managed to keep this tenuous situation afloat was vested in the promise of quantum gravity. There was really only one possibility of resolving the contradiction between general relativity and quantum theory in such a way that the basic form of general relativity was preserved. This was the prospect of quantizing space-time curvature, and thereby essentially subsuming general relativity into the manifold of quantum field theory. If physicists actually succeeded in developing such a theory, then it seemed possible that both general relativity theory and quantum theory could survive mostly intact by being incorporated into a kind of quantum super theory. And therefore, the grand proclamations made by astrophysics would also survive unscathed. Yet, unsurprisingly, it is a bit easier said than done to merge a theory in which time is basically an illusion with a theory in which time is objectively real. It is not exactly obvious how it might be possible to reconcile a framework in which time is essentially a fourth spatial dimension with a framework in which space is space and time is time. The first insinuations of a quantum gravity super theory can be traced back to the 1920s, and over the course of the next hundred years, many of the most intelligent and thoroughly educated human beings who have ever lived have repeatedly attempted to crack the puzzle of quantum gravity. 
yet repeatedly we have seen that every single one of these attempts has failed. It's usually at this point in the discussion when science apologists once again defer to the Feynman-esque shut-up-and-calculate mentality. Perhaps the universe is just too bizarre for our stupid monkey brains to understand. Hey, what do you know? You're not a physicist. You aren't authorized to have opinions about the sacred wisdom, right? We should simply trust the science, right? Hey, maybe we just need a really advanced AI to figure this all out for us. Or maybe the science was wrong. Despite Karl Popper's incessant rolling in his grave, general relativity-based cosmology has been making failed predictions consistently since its very inception. As early as the 1930s, astronomers who attempted to calculate the mass of distant galaxies realized that if galaxies are indeed held together by a gravitational force which operates in the manner implied by general relativity, then galaxies do not have nearly enough mass to actually produce the gravitational force needed to actually hold them together. In other words, if general relativity were correct, then we would expect these galaxies to fly apart rather than maintaining their form, and moreover, they shouldn't have been able to actually form in the first place. There is no known phenomenon within the standard cosmological model which could account for this discrepancy, and so one might idealistically assume that this would have led astrophysicists to cast doubt upon the veracity of general relativity. But for reasons which we've already examined, astrophysicists were unwilling to actually do so, and those who were willing to express skepticism towards relativity cosmology were typically ridiculed as out-of-touch quacks. Instead, physicists proposed the existence of dark matter as a way to resolve this discrepancy. Now, of course, it is sometimes perfectly reasonable to make inferences about things which cannot be directly observed. If I go outside and the ground is wet, then I can reasonably conclude that it had rained even if I did not observe the rain itself. None would take issue with this because rain is a well-known phenomenon and thus would seem to be the most obvious and reasonable explanation for why the ground is wet. But let's say that I have a theory that implies that rain should not be possible. I go outside and notice that the ground is wet, but I am very confident in my theory and thus very confident that rain should not be real. I thus proclaim that the ground must be wet because of dark moisture and then congratulate myself for making a groundbreaking scientific discovery. Dark matter is kinda like that. We have no reason to believe that dark matter is actually real beyond the need for it to exist in order to preserve relativity-based cosmology. The existence of dark matter is not implied by any other theories of physics. None of the exotic particles hypothesized within quantum theory fit the bill for the properties which dark matter would need to have in order to do what scientists need it to do, and of course, there has never been any indication of a detection of dark matter by any scientific instruments. The idea of dark matter exists specifically to plug a massive hole in the theoretical dam, but that hole is by no means the only one. The Hubble constant is a term which refers to the hypothesized expansion rate of the universe. It is called a constant because it is assumed that this expansion rate should be consistent throughout time and space. This nomenclature is a bit ironic, however, as different attempts to measure this presumed constant have produced a very striking disparity, and one which has only grown increasingly more acute as ever more precise measurements have been made. If I use two tape measures to calculate the area of my house and those two tape measures give me two very different numbers, then that implies that there is something very wrong with one or both of my tape measures. In addition, measurements seem to indicate a disparity between the value of the expansion rate in the early universe and the expansion rate in our present time frame. This has led some to suggest that the so-called constant may have actually diminished over time. 
This might not seem like too much of an issue. After all, it seems fairly plausible that certain relationships or processes in our universe may have changed over the course of cosmic evolution. But the expansion of the universe is believed to be due to the effect of vacuum energy, a kind of repulsive force which is predicted within quantum theory. The problem is that if this cosmic expansion is due to this vacuum energy, then it should be an actual constant. It should certainly not be a variable, which changes over time. At any rate, the value of vacuum energy inferred from observation has never matched the value predicted by quantum theory anyway. This discrepancy in predicted and observed values for vacuum energy is absolutely enormous, some 120 orders of magnitude. In other words, the value of vacuum energy inferred through observation seems to be missing 120 zeros. This problem has therefore come to be known as the vacuum energy catastrophe and described as, quote, the most embarrassing problem in all of physics and, quote, the worst theoretical prediction in all of physics. These problems are just a few of the numerous and very serious issues which have emerged over the course of the past hundred years, and physicists seem no closer to solving these problems now than they were when these problems first began to emerge. Garnering more precise measurements and more observational data through the deployment of ever more technically sophisticated and exorbitantly expensive instruments has given us no progress but only more problems. Following the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope in 2021, astronomers have come to achieve images of our universe at far greater distances than has ever before been possible. This is an immensely extraordinary technological achievement, certainly, but the world which the JWST has come to show us is one that simply should not exist if the assumptions of relativity-based cosmology are actually correct. The JWST is able to detect images from extremely distant regions of our universe. If it is indeed the case that light behaves in the manner implied by general relativity, then this implies that we are seeing these hyper-distant regions as they were many billions of years ago, not as they presently are. If the universe is actually expanding in the manner implied by inflationary cosmology, then this would imply that the JWST is giving us images of the very early universe. The universe as it existed only a few hundred million years after our universe supposedly emerged from the Big Bang. Yet, the images provided to us by the JWST show us morphologically mature galaxies. Galaxies which should not exist because there should not have been enough time since the birth of our universe to allow for their formation. These galaxies appear as though they have been there for billions of years, even though these images presumably depict a universe which is in its infancy. One way or another, something has to give. These are not problems which can be solved by simply sprinkling in a bit of extra dark matter or dark energy in order to plug the holes, as academics have previously attempted to do, and it truly seems like an act of faith to presume that somehow things will ultimately land in such a manner that Einstein will turn out to have been right all along. What seems much more likely is that we will soon come to see that we actually know far, far less about the nature of our universe than academic scientists have let on. Does it really seem that implausible that we might actually not understand what light actually is and how it operates? Doesn't it seem reasonable to conclude that we might actually not understand how stars and galaxies actually develop? Is it completely unreasonable to suggest that gravity might be something other than what Einstein thought it was, especially when that understanding simply does not accord with our understanding of the universe at the quantum scale? Presumably most people, and most scientists throughout history for that matter, would find those to be perfectly reasonable conclusions. 
mistakes were made. That is simply a thing that happens rather frequently, in fact, within scientific pursuits, and it is clearly time to return to the drawing board and attempt to think about these problems in new ways with new theories which do not follow the supposed rules which have clearly failed us. Yet for academic doctrinal science, science which has come to be understood as an elite priesthood of sacred knowledge, this conclusion is simply unacceptable. There is simply too much at stake. For many decades now, science popularizers have repeated and reinforced the idea that the knowledge which has been sanctioned by the elite is knowledge which can be relied upon with certainty. Thousands of professional careers have been built upon the theories which have come to be regarded as doctrine and which have been systematically taught to students and the general public as facts, not as mere conjectures or possibilities. Admitting error here would mean admitting that thousands of expensive textbooks are filled with theories that simply do not work. It would be admitting that many of the claims presented as facts by science popularizers in books, films, television specials, and public presentations were not actually true, and it would be admitting that many tens if not hundreds of billions in taxpayer dollars may have been spent on wild goose chases which were initiated by professional researchers who were much more interested in lucrative grant opportunities than they were interested in being honest about how certain they really were about the theoretical presumptions of their research initiatives. This is, as they say, a really bad look, and gets much worse once we start looking at how academic scientists have treated those who have dared to suggest that the accepted doctrines might be incorrect. This is Professor Dave. From what I've gathered, Dave is not actually a professor, so I'm not going to call him that anymore, but nonetheless, Mr. Dave runs a very popular science YouTube channel, which serves essentially the same sociological function as other forms of science apologetics, and his views are very standard with regards to forms of scientific research which fall afoul of institutionally authorized doctrines. In this video, Dave tries his hand at dismantling the theoretical framework of electric universe theory, an alternative cosmological model which we have looked at a bit already in previous videos. Electric universe theory is a theoretical framework which proposes that the primary driving force in cosmic evolution and morphogenesis is in fact electromagnetism rather than gravity. Electric universe theorists essentially abandon Einsteinian cosmology and instead try to model phenomena such as star formation and galaxy formation in terms of electromagnetic forces rather than relying predominantly upon the effects of gravity. Now, before any of you courageous keyboard warriors brush aside your harems of full-body waifus to educate me with one of those dissertation-length comments that I don't actually read, keep in mind that I really do not care about the plausibility or veracity of any particular claim made by researchers within the Electric Universe community. I'm familiar enough with the Electric Universe community to know that there are some claims made within the theory which I think are misguided and probably false, and there are others which I find very interesting or even find likely to be true. Either way, that is not the point I am making here. The point I want to make here is about how Mr. Dave goes about ridiculing the scientists who dare to suggest that his holy books might be missing something. So let's take a look at that. We know for a fact that this equation describes our reality. We use it to calculate the trajectories of objects both on Earth and in space, and they are always corroborated to high degrees of precision. Furthermore, we understand electromagnetism at least as well as we understand gravity. We have electricity, we have an understanding of materials, science, semiconductors, batteries, and other assorted phenomena. So how is it that we understand gravity so well, and electromagnetism so well, but not well enough to realize that one is the other? But in the end, Electric Universe is just another flavor of paranoia and mysticism, as I will demonstrate for you here. Now to begin with, we can see that Mr. Dave begins his entire deconstruction on the presumption that electric universe theory essentially amounts to a reduction of gravity to electromagnetism. 
This is already misleading. Not all electric universe theorists presume that gravity is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Some hypotheses have been formulated by EU theorists which attempt to model gravitational effects in terms of electromagnetic relationships, but not all EU theorists find these attempts convincing, and frankly, neither do I. Regardless, what I really want to call attention to here is Mr. Dave's flippant dismissal of what he, albeit mistakenly, perceives to be the entire premise of electric universe cosmology. Dave insists that gravity simply cannot be an electric phenomenon because we know how electromagnetism works and because we know how gravity works. Mr. Dave seems to be simply uninterested in actually considering any of the theoretical models, arguments, or purported evidences which are discussed within electric universe theory. We simply know that the accepted doctrines are true, and therefore any conflicting ideas can be safely dismissed and ridiculed. But Mr. Dave, I really gotta ask, do we actually know how gravity works? Can we really be so certain here that we can simply dismiss any and all alternative possibilities as being nonsense, which is simply unworthy of serious consideration? I, for one, am much less confident that we can. If we really were so certain, then we probably wouldn't expect our understanding of gravity to result in numerous and consistently repeated failures of theoretical predictions to actually accord with observational data. Now, that doesn't necessarily demonstrate that electric universe theory is completely or even partially correct, but it sure as hell casts a very bad light on the practice of declaring your opponent to be a fraud simply because you feel super duper certain that you've got the whole story figured out already because you decided to believe something that an authority figure told you in school. Magnetic monopoles definitely exist, and they power perpetual motion machines for like fast travel, like in WoW, but only wealthy people are allowed to use them. This is a video about crackpots. That's it. That's the intro. This is a video by another very popular science YouTuber who goes by the moniker A Collier Astro. This video is titled Physics Crackpots, and in this video, this person articulates a very colorful narrative about people who she deems to be crackpots. People who believe that they are capable of actually doing theoretical physics, or at least criticizing standard physics, but who are, so we are told, really just a bunch of lunatics who have lost their grip on reality. Again, here I should add a disclaimer. There are certainly some real people who want to do science and who come up with ideas that probably don't hold much water. That isn't a bad thing at all, in my opinion, and there is no rule of science which decrees that enthusiastic amateurs are incapable of actually contributing valuable insights to scientific theories. In fact, there is a very strong tradition of amateur scientists making very important contributions to science from outside the walls of academia, and institutionalized science itself only became possible due to the efforts of independent researchers and theorists. The eccentric weirdos who were willing to think outside of the box before there even was a box. Now, of course, there are a lot of eccentric weirdos in the world with radical and sometimes outlandish ideas. I am one of those people. This implies that most of those radical ideas are going to be at least partially false, simply because the possibility space of ways the world could be is vastly larger than what the world actually is. And of course, as Miss Astro implies, there are some people who are kinda nutty and definitely not very pleasant to speak to, so yes, there is that. Nonetheless, the picture which Miss Astro paints for us is not simply about a small handful of unpleasant nut jobs, as we shall see. As her initial presentation makes very clear, she is using the term crackpot to refer to those in general who express skepticism towards establishment physics. As her video continues, we see her definition of crackpot gradually expand, first to encompass anyone who might presume to actually do physics outside of academic institutions, and then to include even professional engineers who would dare to overstep their bounds into the hallowed halls of theoretical physics. The picture which she paints for us is quite vivid. 
There's a certain kind of person who develops models of theoretical physics which don't accord with those of mainstream academia. These people are weird and creepy and really just don't understand that physics is something that can only be done correctly by those who are truly qualified, those who are the stewards of truths which the general public is simply incapable of making direct contact with. You, dear viewer, are permitted to look, but not touch, and when you overstep those bounds, you run the risk of putting yourself in the category of creepy, maniacal perverts who deserve only pity or ridicule. Miss Astro repeatedly and heavily implies throughout her video that these people are obviously and categorically wrong, and yet that can only be the case if mainstream physics is obviously and categorically correct. Yet, as we have seen, this is far from the case, and so it doesn't exactly seem very laughable to me that some very intelligent people would attempt to develop alternative theories which solve the problems which are endemic to physics by thinking outside of the box. Ms. Astro, however, presents us with a rather different narrative. According to her, the primary motivation for the creation of such alternative theories comes from people who attempt to dive in headfirst into physics which is too advanced for them to understand. They find themselves incapable of contending with the arcane nuances of advanced physics, and out of sheer frustration and incredulity, they then proceed to clumsily throw together a nonsensical non-theory. Miss Astro doesn't really even bother to address the possibility that there might be many people who actually do understand these theories very well, who might look at some of the issues we highlighted earlier and think that something isn't right. Her video is not about discussing potential solutions to problems in physics or why certain possible solutions are probably unviable. Her purpose was to paint a certain picture of those she considers to be her enemies, to show that those who are critical of mainstream physics are creepy looney tunes who cannot be trusted or taken seriously. Repeatedly throughout her video, Miss Astro insists that she is using the term crackpot to refer specifically to people who are trying to do physics without having an adequate grasp of the prerequisite mathematical schemas which physicists use to develop their models. Now, of course, there probably are people like that who do exist, people who are trying to bite off more than they can chew without realizing it. And, of course, there are people who are a bit unhinged and overly zealous with their pet theories. However, shortly after the publication of this video, Ms. Astro released another video with the word crackpots conspicuously plastered upon the thumbnail. But this video is not about eccentric amateurs who are in over their heads. This video is about, among other things, the physicist Avi Loeb, who Miss Astro tells us is a crackpot. So, is Avi Loeb an eccentric, creepy, and unhinged amateur who does not understand the mathematics needed to actually do physics? No. Avi Loeb is the Frank B. Baer Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University and the Director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Loeb absolutely understands his math, and he is in no way whatsoever an eccentric, creepy amateur. Nonetheless, Miss Astro seems to see no contradiction between her labeling of Loeb as a crackpot and the picture of what a crackpot is, which she detailed in her previous video. Miss Astro actually goes out of her way to reiterate her definition of a crackpot, mentioning yet again that crackpots are people who try to understand physics without really understanding physics, before proceeding to label Avi Loeb, a professional physicist, as a crackpot for suggesting that an interstellar object might be of extraterrestrial origin. In this same video about Avi Loeb, Ms. Astro also proceeds to suggest that Francis G.J. Perry, a professional nuclear physicist, was a crackpot. Why? Because he spent much of his later career working on ideas which he believed might allow physics to circumvent the non-locality implied by Bell's theorem. 
Now, if you've never heard of Francis Perry, the reason for that is because he simply did not succeed, and I myself am inclined to believe that Perry was chasing intuitions which ultimately proved to be misguided. People are simply wrong about things sometimes. It happens, and yet Miss Astro isn't satisfied with looking at why Perry may have been misguided. Her goal is to use Perry, who was, again, an actual nuclear physicist, as an example of a person who was willing to push back against establishment doctrines due to being a crazed nut job. Miss Astro doesn't even attempt to consistently apply the definition of the central term, which she herself coins and defines. What this makes very clear is that Miss Astro's physics crackpots video wasn't really about eccentric creepy amateurs who don't know the math. Her video was about creating a very certain kind of association with the word crackpots, which she could then use to ridicule and discredit those who stray from the beaten path even if they are literally professional physicists at Harvard University. So does this then imply that someone like, say, Eric Weinstein is also a crackpot because he suggests that Einstein may have been wrong? Is Gary Nolan a crackpot because he is willing to seriously consider the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation? Are figures like Alfred North Whitehead, Henri Bergson, or Chris Longin crackpots because they have attempted to flesh out the metaphysical implications of quantum mechanics rather than just dutifully crunching numbers? Now, I really don't have too much of an opinion on whether or not Loeb or any other particular thinkers are actually right or wrong about whatever particular theories they have proposed or endorsed. They could be right about some things or wrong about others. That's the name of the game, of course. But it seems very antithetical to the very soul of science to simply dismiss people who stray from the beaten path by calling them crackpots. And yet, what Miss Astro and Miss Mr. Dave show us very clearly is that such an attitude is both prevalent and widely accepted as normal within modern academic culture. This all begs the question as to why physicists or any other academics would find these tactics to be necessary. If the evidence really were so firmly on their side and there really were no major reasons to doubt mainstream physics or cosmology, then why bother making videos like these? Why not just demonstrate that the mainstream theories can actually be trusted? If the contradictions, failed predictions, and unexplainable observations don't give us good reason to believe that mistakes were made along the way, then why not? Why reduce oneself to making fun of other people with different ideas rather than actually handling oneself with maturity and authenticity? Why try to convince people not to take certain ideas seriously if you really believe that those ideas cannot withstand careful scrutiny anyway? If you've stuck with this video thus far, first of all, good job. You're the best. And second of all, I want to make it very clear that the story I've attempted to articulate here should not be taken as a reason to regard scientists in general as untrustworthy. There are innumerable scientists who are brilliant thinkers with great ideas who are genuinely interested in an open-minded and honest pursuit of truth. Those scientists aren't necessarily going to agree with me about everything, or even agree with each other for that matter, and that's kind of the point. We should be able to hear people out on their own terms, while always being willing to consider that received wisdom might simply be wrong, no matter how authoritative that wisdom might proclaim to be. The practice of genuine science necessitates an open-mindedness towards new ideas and likewise necessitates a certain skepticism towards any forms of established doctrines. Insofar as academics have increasingly become simply the stewards and apologists of established doctrines, they have also ceased to be actual practitioners of science. Science is not an algorithmic procedure any more than it is a codified corpus of professionally authorized beliefs. 
science is not what the textbooks tell us or even what scientists believe to be true. Science is fundamentally a metaphysical presumption about the capacity for human beings to directly experience and apprehend the formative composition of the natural world. Science is therefore the presumption that we can actually see the truth rather than simply receiving the truth as it is handed down to us by institutional structures of authority. The further science becomes removed from such direct experiential contact with the world, the more science ceases to be genuinely scientific, and the more so-called science comes to be no more than yet another ideology conditioned by entanglements of financial, political, technological, and institutional power. We cannot and should not trust the science, understood as a set of beliefs which are legitimized by an institutional elite, but we can instead trust science, the actual practice of bringing our ideas into engagement with the world as a means of revealing the inner nature of the world. Science is, in essence, a practice of making the invisible manifest, and therefore science is, and can only possibly be, a form of spiritual co-participation with the world. Science is not and cannot be a mere algorithmic procedure which passively filters truth from falsehood so as to compile a corpus of professionally authorized certainties. Scientific naturalism is only one side of the coin, and the other side of that coin is metaphysics. The presumptions we make about the nature of reality itself and the language of key metaphors which shape how we think about the world and how we attempt to reveal the world through engagement with it. Insofar as modern institutionalized science refuses to engage with metaphysics, it will continue to operate within the bounds of a metaphysical framework which has become rigidified, and which is therefore incapable of evolving in accordance with the world which we are continually coming to reveal. In many ways, institutional science has come to manifest as a kind of inverted and pathological parody of itself. The doctrinal nature of academic science stands in direct opposition to the innermost spirit of science itself. The pursuit of truth cannot be something which degenerates into a specialized art form which can only be legitimately engaged in by a tiny minority of institutionally authorized elites. Nonetheless, genuine science continues to be practiced, sometimes by professional researchers and sometimes by much more unlikely figures. Science is not dead, but it seems to have entered into a kind of subdued state in which it is only able to proceed by reaching up through the cracks of the titanic institutional edifice which has been constructed on top of it. Thanks for watching.